August 1943, Canada. At the first Quebec conference, Allied chiefs were planning new strategy. Expecting European victory in a year, the Allies now marshal their forces against Japan. The President knew that distances had put a premium on long-range air power. To strike Japan, he had a new weapon. Roosevelt promised 200 B-29 superports by March 1944. Inside the Chateau Frontenac at the Joint Chiefs Conference, General Arnold proposed to pierce the inner zone of Japan's homeland with the unbuilt bombers from bases to be erected in China. It was a bold plan. At the time of the Quebec Conference, we only had 11 superforts. Hap Arnold's motto was to become famous. He announced, the difficult we do immediately. The impossible takes a little longer. There were only seven months to keep the promise. It was a race with time. We aircraft workers came from all walks of life. A few of us had built planes in World War I. We were a part of the strength of America now working for Boeing, Bell, and Martin. Their factories had sprung up across the country, in Georgia, in Kansas, in Nebraska, in the state of Washington. Things had certainly changed. In 20 years, America's aviation industry had come of age. Unskilled workers became highly productive because the cranes and jigs and tools were so designed. Boeing engineers helped us make a new wing that could carry more weight faster and higher than any we'd ever built. In each plane, there were 55,000 numbered parts, thousands of miles of wiring, a million rivets. From its transparent nose to its tail, this was a complicated machine. Nevertheless, the Air Force ordered the assemblies like pieces for a giant jigsaw puzzle. By December, only four months after the President's promise, we put together 35 super forts. Then, every hour of every day, identical miracles of modern machinery were brought together. We workers witnessed an inspiring sight, a welding of vision and reality, of free men and their need for peace, of national defense and American industry. Building the superfort was a climax in the history of man's conquest of the air. the dreams of Billy Mitchell and Frank Andrews, the plans of Hap Arnold and Tui Spots. Thus, the 99-foot-long aerial giant spreading 141-foot wings was born. By the end of January, 142 superforts were accepted. Three quarters of America's promise and our pipelines were full. Here were 65 tons of fighting fury, the biggest fastest and most powerful bomber in the world. Now our sons and brothers could take the B-29 to war. In sharp contrast, halfway around the world in China, the other half of the Superfort miracle unfolded. Armies of laborers were building a network of air bases almost by hand. These lean, sinewy Chinese, measuring their work by the remaining earth pyramids, wrote a magnificent chapter in the saga of the superfort 2,000 years after their ancestors had built the Great Wall for the defense of China. 
Here were the same primitive methods, baskets and hoes, muscles and goodwill, and wheelbarrows which squeak to keep imaginary devils away. With the machinery of only their million hands, stone by stone was patiently set. A modern Chinese wall was taking shape. Under the direction of 26 American officers and enlisted men, and at a cost of $150 million, thousand men gangs, following their own flagmen, rolled out four great air bases. April 24th became a day for us in the 20th Bomber Command to remember. General Saunders and Colonel J. Carman led the B-29 parade into Chengdu. Nearly all the immense airfields were ready for business. They had been built in only three months. Here was our superport. It had hopped the Atlantic, Africa, and India. It flew from Kansas to China in a week. It didn't seem possible, but only a year and a half after the first experimental B-29 was flown, a fleet of American aerial dreadnoughts were arriving in China. Next stop, Japan. Within 10 days, our Asiatic strength was 130 superports. Directed by the Joint Chiefs of Staff because of our long range and power, we were the first units of the 20th Air Force. The President's promise was being kept. With more superforts on the way, the runway builders never stopped. In China, a land of miracles, unskilled hands were pounding out a path to victory. Meanwhile, in Japan, 1,500 miles to the east, other hands had forged a modern war machine. Geared for war since 1928, their production rolled on. Like the Germans, they believed their empire invulnerable. Since Pearl Harbor, steel capacity had doubled. One third was hammered into ships, ships to exploit conquered lands ships to support far-flung military forces. Though suffering from shipping sunk by the Allies, Japan maintained the world's third largest merchant fleet with continued launchings. Korea and Manchuria, connected by an efficient merchant marine, formed an industrial empire three times larger than Germany. Their ground forces had expanded to five million fanatics, nearly four times their strength at the time of Pearl Harbor. As the conquerors of half a billion people, they had to be stopped. By June, our bases in China were working around the clock. The Joint Chiefs of Staff had ordered an attack on Japan. How many bombers could be sent? Our answer was 50. Not enough, get at least 70. A maximum effort was necessary. It would relieve enemy pressure in East China, help the invasion of Saipan, our future Pacific base. Our target was Yawata, Japan's heavily guarded Pittsburgh. Yawata, which made one-fifth of all Jap steel. General Wolfe was winning the big gamble. His idea to train our crews while we tested the experimental B-29 was putting both men and planes in combat six months sooner. We were doing the impossible. Theater Air Commander and Wolf watched 68 superforts become airborne. Almost the entire force ordered for this historic mission. We 
followed the lead ship named Lady Hamilton. We followed General Blondie Saunders and his pilot, Colonel Howard Engler. We followed the Marines who landed on Saipan this morning. We headed out high over the Yangtze River. Guided by our navigators, we began the long hop across the Yellow Sea. Landfall, Japan. The enemy was waiting. Up came heavy, bursting flak. Nearly five miles below lay the sprawling mills that armed the Japs. Jimmy Doolittle had said we'd be back. And we were. After Pearl Harbor, our superforts had struck Japan. Land-based planes dropped bombs through clouds on Yawata. Damage was done to the Kokura arsenal. Punishment to the steel industry was not extensive, but the B-29 Blitz was underway. A global bomber and a global air force were in operation. The beginning of the end of the Japanese Empire was underscored in exploding bombs that reminded the Japs of Pearl Harbor. The growing systematic waves of destruction had started. From China and later from Saipan, the Allies were forging a huge nutcracker to crush the enemy. General Arnold's determined order, make them the biggest, gun them the heaviest, and fly them the farthest, was carried out. He warned the enemy, no part of the Japanese Empire is now out of our range. No war factory too remote to feel our bombs. The battle for Japan is now underway with full speed ahead. June 1944, the English Channel. A bridge of Allied supply ships streamed into Normandy, and the beachhead grew. A week after D-Day, half a million men and their weapons had landed in France. Strengthening the beachhead by advances up to 20 miles, their goal was victory in Europe. Our aviation engineers had followed the assault waves in. Work began on the landing strips as soon as we unloaded our equipment. Some emergency runways were ready for operations in six hours. Around us, the Signal Corps boys strung up over a mile of wire every minute. Communications, reinforcements and supplies were building up for a powerful offensive designed to break out of the bulging Normandy pocket. We pushed south to gain elbow room. But the planned advance by 1st Army Commander General Bradley was falling behind Eisenhower's timetable. We kept jabbing towards San Lo in rough hedgerow country. A stubborn struggle against strong enemy resistance. The Germans, although one counterattack was smashed, rallied again. They ordered up crack parachute regiments and panzer divisions to seal off the Allied beachhead. Hitler ordered his divisions to hold and force a stalemate. Methodically, they scoured the front with fire to prevent any break through San Lo. Effective. Roads and communications blocked, the Allied advance far down the line came to a halt. These were the worst days of the bloody Normandy campaign. The ground troops dug in and waited for a break. 
Those of us in Pete Posada's 9th Tactical Command had been waiting too. Now clearing weather gave us a chance to crack the San Lo block. 300 fighter bombers in half an hour. Following us were the heavies. 1,500 were to pass over the target within 60 minutes. A plane every two seconds. Cobra was the plan name. With it, Eisenhower hoped to demoralize the enemy in a sector five miles long and one mile wide. Including medium bombers, nearly 2,400 planes wove this carpet of bombs. bombing worked. Now General George Patton could deploy his armored columns for a dash across France. But his right flank would be open, so he made a deal with air for close support. Assured that General O.P. Whalen's 19th Tactical Air Command would provide fighter bomber protection, Patton plunged towards Germany 400 miles away. This signaled the start of air tank warfare with extraordinarily successful results. Each fighter bomber acted as the eyes of an armored column and communicated by radio phone. Our job was to attack enemy concentrations in advance of our ground forces. September, the Allies, clear of the hedgerows and in command of the situation, now pursued the enemy. Protected and supplied by air, the mobile U.S. Third Army in one month was at the doorstep to Germany. Air tank teams in their famous dash across France had opened a road to freedom. For the first time in military history, an entire German division quit fighting because of pressure from the air. Credit for these punishing attacks goes to the 19th Tactical Air Command. The formal surrender ceremony at Beaugency Bridge was held up until General Whelan could attend. Our 405th Fighter Bomber Group had persuaded German General Elster to surrender his division consisting of 20,000 officers and men. Major General Robert Macon represented the Allies in this unique ceremony. As for the German and his troops, they were the victims of three weeks of incessant air attacks which had protected Patton's right flank. Accordingly and appropriately, General Wayland, head of the 19th Tactical Air Command, proudly represented his outfit at the ceremony. Their strafing attacks especially helped cage the enemy spirit. From England and the continent, the directive under which we opened our autumn campaign put German oil in first priority. Next on our target list came munition plants, transportation, and aircraft factories. Our orders were to flatten what was left of enemy war production.
But the Luftwaffe menace was not entirely wiped out. With amazing recuperative powers, with underground factories, with hoarded gasoline, with 350 airfields, the Germans again had air power. General Spots reported to Washington that the German Air Force had more fighter planes toward the end of 1944 than ever in its history. On several occasions, the Luftwaffe showed that its new strength could be brought to bear against American bomber formations. Daring rage at his fighter commanders, calling them cowards and threatened to transfer them into the infantry. Even so, he began to employ his forces in large, concentrated air battles. Germans attack. led by ruthless men who had sought to dominate the world, was overwhelmed and crushed to a degree never before experienced in the history of modern war. With final capitulation by German leaders, a great war had been won. The men who won it, the Allied armies, navies, and air forces, had triumphed over a host of relentless, desperate, and powerful enemies. At the Berlin surrender, the U.S. Air Force was ably represented by General Spots, who helped lead the Allied air supremacy, which had trampled out the path to victory in Europe. Air power, according to General Half Arnold, was our margin of success. On this VE Day, he reminded the free world never to forget those men who gave their lives for this victory.
early 1944, East China. From key bases like Kuelin, the small 14th Air Force accomplished miracles with the aircraft at their disposal. The frontier flying tigers fought the Japs with initiative, ingenuity, and superior tactics. General Claire Chenault's Air Force suffered chronic shortages. They had only such supplies as could be flown across the hump or replacement parts which they cannibalized from their own aircraft. Nevertheless, they did an amazing job of maintenance under the most primitive field conditions. Despite the lack of gasoline, equipment, and personnel, they ran effective fighter and bomber operations along a 5,000-mile front. Then came June 1944, and the Jap offensive got rolling. When the Chinese armies could no longer protect our bases, we had to get out. During seven terrible months, we had to evacuate 13 of our airfields. Even the modern ones, which thousands of Chinese had built for us under desperately trying circumstances. And so in East China, American bombs demolished American bases. The 14th Air Force, tasting temporary defeat, regrouped at other bases in China. The 5th Air Force advanced in the Pacific. Liberators operating from captured fields like Biak now prepared the way for the Philippine campaign. Our mission was to neutralize the enemy on the islands we had bypassed. Our commanders, MacArthur and Kenny, felt there were too many Jap strongholds behind us and around us to be healthy. Air power had to remove the threat of enemy attacks on the flank and the supply line of our proposed amphibious landing. We were ordered to continually pound enemy concentration centers and sea lanes. In no previous Pacific operations did the preparatory phase cover such a vast area. To isolate the Philippines, our next battleground, we employed four battle-tested air forces. The 14th from China, the 5th, 7th, and 13th from Pacific Island bases like Biak, Anguar, and Moratai. Pacific warfare was island warfare. It was our job to cripple key bases in the shrinking Japanese Empire. Our targets were enemy installations and the convoy supplying them. And so, island by island and ship by ship, we worked our way back to the Philippines. Dropping bombs from minimum altitude was no longer risky because of General Kenny's idea, attaching parachutes to fragmentation bombs. In this way, parafrags could be safely scattered on enemy targets in low-level attacks. As the enemy built new airstrips to protect the Philippines, our concerted attacks from distant bases pounded them to rubble.
With these raids, we had softened up the approaches to the Philippines, and fulfillment of the promise to return was now in sight. On 19 October, an Allied armada of combatant assault vessels maneuvered in Philippine waters. The Joint Chiefs of Staff had decided on Leyte as the invasion island. Two great amphibious forces of more than 700 ships converged. MacArthur knew that Leyte defenses were heavy. Nonetheless, the 10th and 24th Corps of the 6th Army headed for shore on schedule. America was keeping her promise to return. 260,000 Jap troops were scattered throughout the islands. From Leyte to Luzon, they tried to stop the Allies from liberating the Philippines. Japanese resistance was in vain. Allied troops advanced from island to island. In each case, the Allied landings were skillfully affected with boldness and surprise, but stubborn and prolonged fighting usually followed in the hills. It took two months of bloody battle to secure Leyte. By January 9th, we were fighting our way on Luzon, towards Manila. The hills of Luzon were a problem ready-made for an air power assist. In cooperation with ground units, we flew tactical missions against Japs holed up in mountain caves. Ground radio control directed our bombing. Japanese severely crippled, successive Allied invasions treaded through the Philippine archipelago to cut up Luzon. U.S. troops and Philippine guerrillas under MacArthur's direction fought many battles supported by General Kenney's Air Force. Next came the rock. Corregidor had special meaning for General MacArthur. He remembered Skinny Wainwright and his men who had suffered five months of battle 28 days of siege, surrender, and the death march. For them, there was a score to settle. The most spectacular air action of the Luzon campaign was this pre-invasion bombing and recapture of Corregidor. General Kenny had proposed that it be retaken from the air. The blitz started January 23rd with the 13th Air Force dropping 500-pound bombs. The 7th Air Force hit the target from Palau. Veterans of the 5th Air Force joined in hammering the Guardian Fortress of Manila Bay. Now, 50 troop carrying C-47s from Indoro headed for Corregidor. The proposed air landing was perilous and problematical. We were about to retake a citadel built before the war by Americans who tried to make it impregnable. We hoped that the month of continuous bombing had softened the rock. 2,065 men faced the ticklish job of jumping into an extremely short and narrow area, a rugged target surrounded by sheer cliffs.
plan to drop on topside worked. We only found scattered opposition. But in making the perilous jump, 19 Americans were killed, 203 injured. The Corregidor return drama developed along the classic Allied pattern in the art of trifibious warfare. All the tools and specialists of air, ground, and naval forces had been pooled together to achieve victory. On February 27th, organized resistance on Corregidor ceased. It was appropriate that on the same day, we returned control of civil affairs to the Commonwealth Government of the Philippines. Within a week, 12 American officers, all veterans of the fall of Corregidor, headed by General of the Army MacArthur, returned to the rock. They came to pay formal tribute to troops of the 503rd Paratroop and 34th Infantry Regiments who captured it. In his remarks, MacArthur said, hoist the colors and let no enemy ever haul them down. The road to victory was a long trek over many bridges won by the combined strength of land, sea, and air. Leading the way in pushing the Jap aggressor back to his home islands and crushing his dreams of empire was the United States Air Force. Nineteen forty four, high over the Pacific Ocean. A fleet of the mightiest super bombers in the world were completing a 5,000-mile flight from San Francisco to Saipan. Less than four months before, the island was in Japanese hands. It was for bases like these that American soldiers, sailors, and Marines had fought the costly battle. On Columbus Day, 1944, B-29s discovered Saipan. Our arrival was a real historic event celebrated with a ballad by a local poet, and it went like this. On the 12th of October, back in 1944, the citizens of Saipan heard a great four-engine roar. Bulldozers fled the runway. The soldiers stopped to cheer as down came Jolton Josie, the Pacific pioneer. It was a great day for the aviation engineers and service groups who had hacked the airfield out of jungle. To them, Jolton Josie was a sensation who shamelessly stole the show. Some Jap officials already knew that Saipan as an American base with its threat of aerial bombardment spelled eventual defeat for Japan. The landing of the B-29s gave reality to that threat. The new arrivals were men who had flown fortresses and liberators in all theaters of war. They were led by a former 1928 flying cadet, who in 1944 was named Deputy Chief of Air Staff and was now commanding the 21st Bomber Command, General Haywood Hansel. Well, the, the first element of the 21st Bomber Command has arrived. When we've done some more fighting, we'll do some more talk. Thank you. All over the Marianas, B-29s were getting ready to carry out the general's promise. Saipan, Tinian, and Guam had been seized by Admiral Nimitz forces for the primary purpose of serving as bases for the very long-range bombers now parked on circular hard stands. The 21st was building up its massive air power as it prepared for the ultimate crushing defeat of Japan. The long arm of the 73rd Bombardment Wing, led by General Rosie O'Donnell, began punching the enemy with appalling strength. Behind this strength was more than bombs and bullets. There was planning. 
In January, the 21st Bomber Command changed hands. Major General Curtis E. LeMay replaced Hansel. By sheer weight of attack, LeMay believed he could force a surrender of Japan. To that end, he ordered a furious pace of operations. Here was his weapon, the Superfort, with 2,200 horses warming up in each of its four engines. Designed to carry more destruction and carry it higher, faster, and farther than any bomber before, the B-29s were like artillery pointed at the heart of Japan. Each plane was armed with 12 50 caliber machine guns, a 20 millimeter cannon, and four tons of bombs. Fully armed, the 21st Bomber Command was taking off for Japan. May sent his bombers out in 100 plane formations to hit Kobe, Nagoya, Tokyo. In two months, he increased the attack missions to 200 planes, building to an 800 plane climax. Jap raids had tried to stop the B-29s. They might just as well have tried to stop an onrushing typhoon. such vastness. We who had battled over Berlin, Ploesti, and Schweinfurt knew it. London to Berlin and back was 1,000 miles. The Foggia Ploesti run, 1150. But Saipan to Tokyo and back was more than 3,000 miles. B-29s were the planes for the job. For all their destructive power, those of us who flew the superports felt they were things of beauty. In flight, our navigators were on the spot. An error of two degrees could put all of us over nothing but ocean in a plane with empty gas tanks. It was a long ride on the longest, toughest bomber missions in the world. As we approached enemy sky, the crews prepared for the deadly business ahead. While making the slow climb to altitude, our gunners warmed up the central fire control system. Inside a super fort, you can't see a gun. You fire by remote control. We had electronics, superhuman brain power at the flick of a switch. Then we waited for the Japs. Fuji meant we were 60 miles from Tokyo. The leading B-29s found their objectives. Now, below us, Tokyo. Tokyo, which the Jap High Command had boasted was outside the range of land-based American bombers. For six months, we had proved them wrong.
satisfied with the results of these high-level precision tactics. Suddenly in March, he switched to low-level, nighttime, maximum effort fire raids. And Japan's dreams of world empire went up in a flaming inferno. B-29s burned out the industrial heart of Japan. One by one, 66 principal cities received their devastating bath of fire until Japan's military situation was hopeless. They could not have held out. They had lost control of the air. Their capacity to wage war was destroyed. The fire raids had even killed much of their fanatical resistance. B-29s were making Japan bleed internally. Then President Truman made a grave decision. To deliver a special bomb, field orders were signed by General Twining. They instructed Colonel Paul Tibbets and his B-29 crew to drop what they called the gimmick. At 0815 on August 6, over military target Hiroshima, Bombardier Major Farabee took over. He was about to drop the atom bomb. Unprecedented destructiveness had exploded. Three days later, a second atom bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Atomic energy had made air power all important. Dread were the threats for the future. Strong the requirement for air power. As suddenly as it started, the war came to an end and surrender ceremonies aboard the Missouri. Without being invaded, without losing a foot of homeland, Japan was surely and utterly defeated. Before the atom bomb, before the Soviet entry into the war, Japan was beaten through the forceful application of allied land, sea, and air power. The Japanese surrender had come so quickly after mounting the B-29 offensive and the atom bomb climax that advocates of air power felt our most optimistic predictions were confirmed. Fully recognizing the contributions by Army and Navy, General Arnold felt that air power's share in the victory may fairly be called decisive. In addition to ushering in the atomic age, the war's end marked one of the revolutionary points in the history of warfare. Control of the air proved to be essential to the success of every major military operation. Coordinated planning and command of ground, sea, and air forces, backed up by the full effort of the home front, had enabled the Allies to secure this control of the air. Air power is the technical instrument of our country's defense. Air power can also be the instrument of peace. The United States Air Force has made it apparent to any potential aggressor that an attack on the United States would be immediately followed by a devastating air atomic counter blow. The atomic weapon thus makes air power the primary requisite of national survival.
14 August, 1945. VJ Day. The Second World War at last is over. With the surrender of Japan comes the great moment of joyous relief. After years of the anxieties and grief and horrors of universal war. In all of the Allied lands, this was a time of rejoicing after great victories. At San Francisco, there had been a momentous event. The people who lined the streets outside the Veterans Memorial Building were symbols of all the anxious people everywhere, who after two great world wars, were waiting for their leaders to find the way to a lasting peace. And it seemed that the way had really been found when here in San Francisco, the victorious countries met to sign the Charter of the United Nations. Nationalist China was a member from the beginning. The signature of France symbolized Europe's longing to escape further ravaging by war. The presence of the Soviet Union's delegate justified the hope, a hope which later proved false, that from now on, every nation would live peaceably within its own borders and respect the rights and sovereignty of other nations. The signing of the UN Charter by Great Britain and by the United States and by other founding nations, until in all, 50 had signed. This offered to mankind genuine hope for freedom from the scourge of war. It really seemed that a new era of peace and goodwill among men of all nations was about to begin. As always in America after a war, there arose great public clamor to bring the boys home. Soon after VJ Day, transport vessels loaded with returning troops were arriving at stateside ports. All the mobilization records were broken. The Army, which then included our Air Forces, was soon down to 20% of its wartime strength. The armed forces were like a boxer who wins and then quits training. Aircraft and air personnel of the Army Air Forces were speedily demobilized in great numbers. Thousands of aircraft were cocooned for possible future use, while thousands of others were either sold or broken up for their metal. From a powerful wartime force of two million men, our air personnel dropped to about one-seventh of that strength. Our recuperative powers remained, but our great strength in the air was suddenly hardly more than a memory. It had been the most destructive war in history. In large segments of the world, cities were in ruins. Business and industry were at a standstill. Countless people were homeless. Before long, the people of the stricken lands were at work on the long, long job of cleaning up the wreckage and rebuilding. As always, the farmers had a lot to do with getting the world back on the track. Our victories in the war had been complete. Still, some of our leaders knew we had better look to the future. One of them was General Hap Arnold, commanding general of the Army Air Forces. We must be sure that none of these victories is wasted and thrown away in the years to come. There will no longer be any spot on Earth and certainly not in America, that is safe from attack by air. For our protection, we must have an Air Force second to none. For this, we need a great aviation industry, a great air transport system, and a great body of trained personnel. But we'll need more than planes and pilots and mechanics. We'll need scientists and mathematicians and we'll need the full inventive genius of the American people. With these, we can protect the future, ourselves and our allies, with the weapons of the future. After the war, small appropriations made it difficult to carry out the program that General Arnold called for. Although we knew that the modernization of our air forces by the development of jet aircraft was a most urgent requirement. The change from propeller-driven airplanes to jet airplanes had to be gradual because of low budgets 
and because it takes years to bring new aircraft from the new operational use. The P-80, one of the early jet fighters, made a spectacular claim to public notice when it flew from Long Beach, California to New York City in four hours and 13 minutes. While jet fighters were coming into operation, jet bombers were still in the development stage. But there came a day when a propeller-driven bomber proved the possibility of a global air force with strategic capability. Here's the Pakusan Dreamboat, a B-29. One day in October 1946, we towed her out at Hickam Field, Honolulu. There were nine of us in the crew, and we had a fine commander, Colonel Clarence Irvine. We'd waited 34 days, partly because of weather conditions, partly because of mechanical difficulties. Everything had to be right. We were going to try to make one of the greatest flights in air history. Non-stop from here in Hawaii, over the North Pole, and on to Egypt, about 10,000 miles away. The first time ever for such a flight. And without refueling. We had a fuel load of more than 12,000 gallons, the heaviest ever carried by a super fortress. Combat gear had been removed, and she had helium in her tires to lighten the load. We had a perfect takeoff after a run of 8,000 feet at 0551 on a Friday. Our route took us across the coast of Alaska and then over the North Magnetic Pole. The dreamboat took us over the top of the world. She was racing an Arctic storm and she had no de-icing equipment. She met every test. She had to. She was blazing an air trail over Greenland, Iceland, England, France, and Italy, and then Egypt. Everybody's pretty tired. And why not? It's Sunday morning now, and we left Honolulu Friday morning. We've been in the air 39 and one half hours. We've flown 9,500 miles nonstop, crossing two continents and landing on a third. Quite a flight. Quite a flight. In 1947, big decisions at the top level of command. World War II had proved the vital significance of air power. So now there is a logical reorganization of our military structure. Henceforth, the Air Force will be a separate service. The Army Air Forces become the United States Air Force. A necessary move first proposed years previously by General Billy Mitchell. W. Stewart Symington becomes the first secretary of the Department of the Air Force. General Carl Spatz, veteran of the early aviation section of the Army's Signal Corps and distinguished for his record in both world wars, becomes the first chief of staff of the United States Air Force. A year or so after World War II, there were more than 300,000 of us in the Air Force. And now we had a uniform of our own. We used to be in the Army. Now we had a new look. And there were about 4,000 of us WAFs, too. Some of us used to be WAFs in the Army Air Forces, and a lot of us joined up after the Air Force became a separate service. October 1947, at Muroc Desert Test Center in California, history is made by this aircraft, the XS-1, and its pilot, Captain Charles E. Yeager. This airplane and this pilot are about to be the first ever to fly faster than the speed of sound in level flight. A B-29 will take the XS-1 aloft and launch her at an altitude of about 35,000 feet. The XS-1 is not a military aircraft, but a flying research laboratory designed to test the effects of supersonic flight upon airplanes. It is powered by four rocket engines. Its weight empty is less than 5,000 pounds, but it carries 8,000 pounds of fuel. B-29s have done a lot of memorable things, but none of them ever before 
at a mission quite like this one. And no airplane ever did what the XS-1 is about to do. Tracking the sound barrier in level flight will be more than a spectacular feat. It will also give the Air Force valuable knowledge of the resources of new propulsive systems. Captain Yeager gets aboard the XS-1. It can't be a long flight he's going to have in the little aircraft. At full power, the flight can't last more than two and a half minutes. But it's going to be a fast one. crews are ready too, to do the timing, the only possible method for timing aircraft at extremely high altitudes. There she goes, a big moment in a history-making flight. Now she's approaching the barrier. The speed of sound at 35,000 feet is 660 miles per hour. A really big moment. Through the sound barrier. The first time ever in level flight. For the first time, except in dives, a man has flown an airplane faster than the speed of sound. It earned Captain Yeager many honors. And the historic plane, the XS-1, earned the resting place in the Smithsonian Institution. Captain Yeager's feat was only one sign that the Jet Age and the Air Force had caught up with each other. Despite low budgets and great technical problems, as rapidly as we could, we were developing modern aircraft like the F-86 Sabre Jet, splendidly ready to prove themselves in battle, ready to serve our country by giving new strength to the rising power of the United States Air Force.